So you join us for uh, much of the evening.
the last one. All right, good evening. At this time, we'd like to call to order the um, Wednesday, May 14, 2008 meeting of the Urban Design Commission. Let's start with roll call. For the record, Mr. Doherty, your mic kind of broke up there, but Mr. Doherty is present, correct? And we have no minutes um, for approval today. Any disclosures this evening? Mr. Kimmer? Uh, yes, I can't remember if I need to disclose for items on the consent agenda. Only if they're pulled. Okay, so in the, if they are pulled, then I need we'll, to make a disclosure. We'll address it then, time. right? Thanks. Any other disclosures? Okay, moving to consent agenda. Any commission members wish to pull any of the cases shown on the consent agenda this evening? And I typically like to ask petitioners either for case 2007-106 or 2008-005 if uh, petitioners or 2007-148, sorry, if there's any objection to any of the staff recommendations you might want to talk about, uh, we'd be happy to pull those cases. Otherwise, we'll proceed. All right. Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion for approval of consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda. I would check on that. We need to make sure we're using our new system here. Mr. Doherty, thank you. And Mr. Briggs, a second. The um, objection to passing the motion is presented. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. I'm involved with case 2007 Come on up front, if you would, Jonathan. Mr. Chairman, my name is Jonathan Steele, and I'm with ECI Higher Architects, and uh, we're representing the university on case 2007-148. And I'm sorry I didn't speak um, as soon as you prompted the audience, but uh, the uh, 
there is one resolution or a department recommendation item number one. Okay. That's fine. If you if you do want to pull the case, we'll have somebody do that, and then we can take that issue up then. Uh, that would be the only one that we would want to clarify or potentially uh, All right. have the language uh, clarified. Just for formalities, could I ask one of the commissioners to formally pull that case from our consent agenda? Oh, it is not? It is. No, it is on the consent agenda. So, again. Can I, uh, I would like to pull uh, case number 2007-148. Right. Thank you, Mr. Briggs. And then we'll take that up when we get that phone. Thank you. If you would. Okay, so now we're talking, um, I guess, just for clarification on the previous motion, balance of consent agenda is okay with you, Mr. Doherty? Mr. Briggs? Short of that case 2007-148. Any objections to passing... Um, of the motion to uh, approve all items on the consent agenda except 2007-148. Any objections? All right, seeing none, that will will pass. So we will then take up case 2007-148 as our first one. Any um, disclosures on that case? All right, Jonathan, if you'd, if you'd like, we can come up and, and talk about the item you want to discuss. So is there a specific, um, one of the recommendations you mean to address here? Or? Yes, and um, <clears throat> the boards are just, if any questions arise with it, we have reference. The packet is, uh, it's 11th hour stuff, but it's not necessarily stuff that needs to be digested. It's just, again, if there were questions, there was a more specific right. document again, we could reference for clarity. Again, if you could state your name for the record again. My name is uh, Jonathan Steele, and I'm with ECI Hire Architects. Again, we're uh, representing the university on this project. Uh, with me tonight is Stan Vanover, who is the project manager with the university in the audience. And also we have uh, David Grant with G ZGF Architects, who's a landscape architect, and Brent Hovey with Dow Engineers, who's a landscape planner. Um, <clears throat> in summary, getting maybe to the meat of the issue, um, the department recommendation of number one, which is to implement the concept that was previously submitted, uh, we have seen changes in the design based on a VE process since the last presentation that has resulted in a significant change in the amenity building in the garage, significant in that there used to be bridges connecting the facility, they're no longer in place, they're two freestanding buildings. Uh, there rep is represented in the packet this evening, but I just wanted to make sure that the recommendation of implementing that initial concept was not a binding document versus the documents of the plans that were submitted. I should also point out that the project right now has been structured with a bidding alternate, which is the amenity building itself. 
And we have in the packet, as a reference, included both a grading plan and a landscape plan showing what would be in place in terms of the final contour of the land and landscaping if the alternate has to be accepted. We are optimistically hoping it doesn't, and what we see is the entire project will be provided. I don't know at this point in time if you want more formal presentation on the project or would just like to open it up to questions relative to department recommendations, but we are seeking tonight both the final landscape approval as well as a site plan approval for the amenity building portion. And we are advancing this request with the assumption that the garage was recognized as part of the previous consideration of the integrated science building and would have been received the site plan approval. Okay, one step at a time here on that. Sharon, can you refresh my memory on the ISB facility? Did we not use that project as a site plan approval for all three? Mr. Chair, the review at that time specifically said in the staff report that the garage would be returning as a separate site plan review. All right. But your recommendations are focused just on landscape, correct? No. It was also to do the final landscape review as well as the site plan review. Okay. All right. So I guess I'm not seeing a disconnect yet between the packet that was submitted and what you're proposing now. So is there an issue with respect to item one that I'm not grasping? Mr. Chair, I think what Mr. Steele is referring to is did you have in your packet from the concept landscape review what their intent was for the site? Yes. Okay. So if you look at that area, it's the area that borders Goose Lake Park to the west. Yes. And you'll see it's, what is it, upland, what were they calling it, the upland forest area? And I don't have that in front of me. If one of you do. It was the Butts, Bruce, wetland zone and the upland zone. And what is staff is recommending here, actually a department recommendation, that that be implemented along that border between Goose Lake Park and the university property. And that's what I assume you're saying you want to deviate from that? I would like to. That's the one recommendation that I would like to address in a little more detail. And we were prepared this evening through representation of David Grant and Brent Hovey to outlay a proposal of some supplemental planning based on the comments that both the university is willing to integrate into the project and are represented. And what they are are the landscaping along those edges that are surrounding the ring road. So perhaps running through that would be in order then. So maybe at this point, I think everyone probably has a good feel for the project itself. The integrated science building is under construction at present. It started as a GCCM process. The intent was envisioned, I think, to add the garage at some point during the interim. The Board of Regents has determined that it was in best interest to solicit bids for the parking garage separate from the contract for the ISB. So we presently have a set of documents for the garage and the amenity building that are out for bid now, are in for plan review. And we're right now maintaining the landscaping or proposing maintaining the landscaping that was approved with the integrated science building. And in the package, you'll see three documents that show a limit of work that have been issued to the bid documents. And it's defining that line. And so tonight we would be speaking to the landscape that is within the limit of this project. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to David Grant to speak a little more in detail on that. My name is David Grant with Simmer Gunsel Frasca Architects. And I'd just like to speak a little more clearly to Recommendation 1. The last package of drawings you received showed 
a clearing on the outside, the north and the west sides of the loop road. And the comments provided, as we interpret them, ask us to soften the edge that that clearing limit was describing. And so we are, in fact, adopting that recommendation. It is in a slightly different fashion than was described in the drawings of July 20, 2007. So we just want to make sure that we're not being bound by those drawings. We have a slightly different plot palette. We do have Black Hills spruce and paper birch, but we use a seed mix on the ground plane that will allow the first successional process to encroach. We're not specifying as many, well, any shrubs, really. It's really just low understory stuff plus about 60 trees or so around the loop area, outside of the loop road, in an attempt to soften that edge of clearing. And that's the intent we're reading in recommendation number one. Are there any questions regarding this? Any questions from the commission? Make sure to push your little buttons. Oh, pushing. Mr. Briggs. Am I good? Yes. A little bit confused. I'm just trying to clarify something for myself. The previous time this was before us, we had staff recommendations, and an additional recommendation to that was in order to achieve the goal of keeping this area in its natural state, additional plantings of native species shall be installed along any edge of the site that enjoins an existing vegetated area. The goal is to blur the cut line and to better integrate the site into its surroundings. I'm assuming that the drawing you're referring to that shows the planting plan for the amenity building, if it is not built, also covers the landscaping along the road. And per that previous condition, I don't necessarily see any additional groupings of trees in order to try and blur that cut edge. And natural succession will take a substantial amount of time. Am I looking at the right sheet? Am I understanding this properly? If you look on these boards, and I might run over here. I'm sorry. I'm going to point out the trees that we've added to address recommendation number one. This is the ring road. Yeah. And what we've done is to pull the species that exist in the forest just beyond the cut line out into loose informal groupings to soften the edge and sort of bring it towards the road. Thank you. Getting me to look up made me aware. I don't know how to end. Any other questions? I can't find my button to ask you. Can I just? Feel free. And we'll help you out. It's a quick clarification. If they don't take the alternate and they do build the amenities building, is everything as it was when we approved this with condition one? You haven't changed the scope at all if they accept the amenities building as part of it? If the amenities building is accepted, what you've seen in terms of the full representation, both in the packet, is in place. We would add the additional landscaping that was just addressed outside the ring road. So the real distinction is understanding clearly what happens if they don't build the amenities building. And we attempted in those two attached sheets to show that what would have been, if the building had been removed, just pretty much a wide open plain. We've actually taken the landscaping to fill that out, fronting the garage. We still have the bioswell drainage that is now placed between the garage and the amenity building. We still have the baller type lights along the pathway slash fire lane. So the intent is to introduce that as the alternate structure. Including all of the landscaping around the loop road? Correct. Okay. All right. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Morgan. New Commissioner Bergeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could I ask, can you briefly tell us what species are added along that area and the size? Those trees are black hill spruce and paper birch. And Brent, have you called out size yet in the construction documents? I was looking at three inch caliper, seven to eight feet tall. Are there shrubs also? No, there's an understory seed mix. It's a revegetation seed mix that 
stabilizes the slopes in that area. There's extensive grading in that area and allows the, the forest understory to encroach into the site. It's difficult to tell from here, but approximate spacing between the trees? They, it, it's quite random. The intent is that they're loosely groved and kind of natural. We're also asking that the contractor have a landscape architect, one of us, on site at the time of the tr uh, tree placement so that we can achieve a natural look that is effective at softening the edge. So I wouldn't say we have fixed spacing. But just on average? Oh, I would say perhaps 15 to 30 feet, something like that. Mr. Briggs? For, for the intent of learning, would you object to a uh, request for additional shrubs in the understory as well in order just to develop and to get it a bit faster than just being a successional intent? I would like to talk to my owner, <laughs> but I think the, the, the fair response that we can represent at this point in time is um, we've introduced this planning with the, the, the thought of visually uh, softening that edge. The understory obviously hasn't been addressed in that. Uh, we would like to maybe consider a, a reasonableness of budget, because this is primarily very pressed right now to do some balance of maybe understory as well as the plantings to meet a goal. Maybe that could be dealt with in terms of an administrative review with staff to kind of strike or find that balance. And just to clarify, the original intent for blurring the edge was that it was understory as well as, uh, as an overstory just to make it so it wasn't a linear cut. Um, so that's why I bring up the question as to whether you'd be objected to shrubs or not. Thank you. Ms. Joyner. Uh, what's in the seed mix? We have four different seed mixes on the site. Uh, if you're referring to the seed mix that's along the forest edge, um, actually regarding any of the seed mixes, if you look in your packet about midway through, the four different seed mixes are described. Uh, I believe that's seed mix A at the forest edge. and. Um, Again, the goal of that, it's a revegetation seed mix. It won't outcompete the plants that are coming in from the forest understory. Uh, it, it, it prevents erosion and encourages the, the reintroduction of the native species. So native species? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for a petitioner? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. And again, because this is um, a request for two actions, we need two separate motions, one for site plan uh, approval and then the other for final landscape. Mr. Chair, as UDC is seen is approving both the site plan and the landscape plan, you could do it as one motion because it's not going on to um, Planning and Zoning Commission. You're sure on that? I'm sure we've done on that, yeah. Kim's had me separate them in the past. We separated them because the site plan review was then going on to Planning and Zoning Commission. Ah, okay. But, All right. Then um, I'd entertain a motion for one approval for both site plan and final landscape. Mr. Briggs. Uh, move to approve UDC case number 2007-148 as meeting requirements for site plan approval and final landscape approval per staff recommendations um, 1 through 9. Didn't mean to add that in a question, it's just a statement. <laughs> With item one as outlined there. Yes. Not, not revised in any way. All right. Do we have a second there? Second by Ms. Josephson. Mr. Brady, do you want to speak to that motion, please? And just as a question with the, uh, I, I may have missed some conversation. Was there any request for a modification of number one? Uh, well, it was the, my understanding, the petitioner pulled 
ask for this to be pulled to clarify their intent of, of modifying the, the previous solution to address item one. And my understanding was that they're not being held to their previous solution, but just the... Or. I believe their concern would be that as written, item one suggested to them that they were going to be held to the previous solution. They presented an alternative. I personally believe the commission might want to clarify that in this motion. If anyone would be willing to offer a friendly amendment that would clarify that uh, better than my current intelligence does, that would be appreciated. Can I add an, an amendment to the uh, motion? Or does it have to be from who seconded it? No. Uh, Feel free. I would like to uh, delete department recommendation number one from the, recommend, from the requirements of final approval. Is that acceptable to? Um, that could be forwarded as a friendly amendment to Mr. Braves if he's satisfied with that. I, I guess uh, it, if it's in unconventional, it would just be to, uh, to ask the take of the uh, commission on that or whether it just requires a uh, change to number one or whether it should be just uh, removed in its entirety. Would, wouldn't we want to replace it with the information that's been submitted in the packet? I would think so, yes. Shall I just reword number one or shall we address it as a friendly amendment? Uh, let me just, I'll change my amendment to we will uh, revise department recommendation number one um, and insert the information provided by the petitioner in place of it uh, for plantings of trees to soften the edge along the wetland. Acceptably, acceptable to you, Mr. Briggs? Acceptable. And Ms. Josephson? All right. You good with that, Patricia? Uh, well, I want to clarify that the information on the boards, I believe, is not in the packet, so they actually need to submit something, because right now we're proving what they're showing us on the boards, but nothing's been submitted in writing or drawings that show. That is, that is a valid point. Yeah. And may I amend myself? I'm not sure of the proper parliamentarian procedure. It, we probably passed that up a long time ago okay. anyway. Okay. Feel free. So. To, to amend the friendly amendment for number one to include uh, submission to staff of the drawings that we see before us to act as the, um, the measure by which they will be measured. Ms. Josephson, all right with you? Yes. Yeah. All right. Mr. Chair, clarification, is there some idea also that shrubs will be part of this or as discussed earlier? I, I was going to speak to that as a, a recommendation to them. I I think that's probably a good way to do that. So if you would support that motion and clarify that piece, I'd appreciate it, Mr. Briggs. Um, thank you. Um, the intent from the previous meeting uh, for the, the recommendations as well as the additional recommendations appears to have been met with uh, the documents you have in front of us this evening. Um, and uh, from an aesthetic point of view, uh, just to reiterate perhaps some of the things we said before, um, it's a, it's, it's a good-looking plan, has nice components to it. and. Um, just to speak, uh, we just had a, a northern design little meeting before uh, birth before this, and just to say that the uh, the light fixtures and those sort of elements that do um, move it beyond to being a, a single season or a couple season design to being a full year design are, are appreciated, especially in a, a lively uh, atmosphere like a university. Um, and then to address two comments would be um, to revisit the seed mix uh, per a workshop that some of the landscape architects in town were at recently. Um, probably specifically to the percentage of annual rye that's in the mix, um, but I believe uh, Mr. Hovey was there, so he can uh, he can use that information to 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 revise that if you would, and then as well to look at the um, the mixture of the trees, uh, hopefully adding some shrubs to it as well, just to uh, to make it a bit more of a natural landscape. Um, I appreciate the intent of setting up to be a successional landscape, but uh, depending upon the species that are there, succession um, takes longer. Sometimes you would necessarily would want it to uh, within our climate. So just providing a, um, a vegetation stock out there and perhaps looking at some species uh, that um, are vigorous uh, colonizers or such that are native, not, uh, <laughs> not non-native species. Um, so thank you. Any other comments? Uh, 
uh, just clarification that that we've tied the petitioner to this version of this of the site landscaping plan my understanding of the motion that we have passed um, which petitioners may object and if they do not feel the same way it's just so we're clear is that we have passed the case for site plan review and landscape approval with staff recommendations substituting item one with the planting solution presented to us tonight it needs to be submitted formally to staff since it was only presented on boards and the issue of undercover is to be resolved with staff at administrative level do yeah. I have that right and, and that's for the base bid or the alternates um, right. okay because the, the what they've handed out doesn't agree with correct hence the second submittal to staff for that piece okay any other comments and and perhaps that is an important clarification that is any of the discussion we have is a base bid discussion yes it is any other comments are there any objections to that motion as presented and clarified seeing none that will carry thank you if if i could we're more than willing to leave the two boards with staff this evening just as a point of record and make Super the formal as well simple. would you prefer it? <laughs> i'll try and pull it up and get it in the case file but i mean we can deliver it tomorrow but if you'd like to have it in hand tonight we can i'll, I'll take it with me tonight thank you john okay thank you thank you and I would urge commissioners to use that request to speak button and the motion and second button. That, that's my job. I'll have to. <laughs> okay. Next to the regular agenda, case 2008-077, landscape plan review for uh, Airport Heights Fire Training Facility, and we'll start with staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Anchorage Fire Department intends to uh, improve and expand the existing facilities at the uh, Airport Heights Fire Training Center. The proposed improvements include a two-story practical applications and fire engine winter storage hoteling building and an adjoining uh, six-story fire rescue training tower. Um, the new buildings um, will be set into the side of the hill located on the south boundary of the site. Uh, the project will also add parking. Uh, the construction uh, budget is um, 20 million dollars the total landscaping budget will be 325,000 of which uh, 700 I'm sorry 276,000 will be devoted to plant materials for landscaping uh, the proposed uh, plannings will be hardy in zone 3 the landscape plans show adequate space for trees and shrubs uh, to naturally mature the project design uh, team has stated that a landscape contractor will be responsible for ma maintaining the landscaping during the first year, after which the, the fire department will be responsible for the long-term care of the landscaping. The horticulture section of the municipality will provide professional level maintenance, pruning, trimming, and replacement planning uh, in the long term. The method of irrigation will be by a water truck. Uh, the variety of new plannings will screen from public view some of the existing and proposed vehicle parking and the prop field um, in the northern part of the uh, of the uh, plans uh, where firefighters in training will engage in practice exercises <clears throat> the plans show uh, native pallet plannings along airport heights drive and within the site the plannings within the site leave room for on-site snow storage the plannings chosen for the area near the Alaska Regional Hospital on the south uh, boundary of the site are more manicured and match the landscaping of the hospital there's uh, deliberately no landscaping near the training towers um, uh, 
they're uh, paved uh, for their use. Um, the proposed landscaping along Airport Heights Drive will provide controlled views uh, onto the site and will enhance and frame the existing and proposed buildings. Uh, the department recommendation um, is for approval of uh, concept public facility landscaping uh, for the Airport Heights Fire Training Center and uh, three conditions can be found on uh, page four of your packets. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Also, the, uh, um, the petitioner for this case is in attendance. Any questions for staff? Just a quick question. Um, is this for landscape approval only or site as well? Concept landscape only. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? None? All right, can we have our petitioner come forward, please? And while you're setting up there, um, we generally uh, start with whether or not you have any objections to the staff recommendation, so perhaps you could address those first. Uh, my name is Ralph Franz. I'm the land, municipal landscape architect on this project. Um, <clears throat> I do have just one clarification on um, item number three, and that has to do with the base bid landscaping. Um, I don't know if you all can see this, but um, we have one area. That material will be part of the base bid, but just for clarification purposes, we have one base bid that includes about a thousand additional square, uh, square feet of seating, topsoil and seating, if that had alternate is, is uh, awarded. And that's directly uh, north of the um, fire maintenance uh, building. So I'm sorry, I missed that. You're saying one of your alternates is planting only? You're right. One of the alternates is topsoil and seed only. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah, I'm just trying to see how that fits into the wording here. It, it's really a minor part, but I just wanted that clarified. Any other questions for petitioner? Any other specifics you wanted to, to point out? No, I'm here for questions. We have our team here as well, if, if any of you have any questions. All right. Any questions? Just for clarification, when you refer to an additional, so there's a base bid is all the vegetation, and then there's an additional additive alternate that's uh, topsoil and seed? Right. All the trees and shrubs are part of the base bid. The majority of topsoil and seed are part of the base bid. There's only one section, about 1,000 square feet of additional topsoil and seed. Can you just point it out, if, if you would mind? Okay. Thank you. Can can emphasize that request to speak button. <laughs> Any other questions for a petitioner? All right, thank you. Entertain a motion for approval. Mr. Kimmer. Um, move to accept UDC case 2007-077, the satisfying requirements of UDC concept re review, and to be forwarded for final approval consideration subject to conditions by staff. We have a second, please. Second by Ms. Kowalski. Would you speak to that motion, please, Mr. Kimmer? Uh, yeah, it looks like... Uh, there's a great buffer along Airport Height Drive. I don't have any questions about uh, the, in, the intent of the project. It looks like quite a facility. Uh, and it looks like it's been well thought out uh, as far as buffering and landscape goes. Any other comments? Mr. Briggs? 
May I offer a friendly amendment? Sure. Um, just to add for point number three, all landscaping shall be part of the base bid with the exception of uh, additive alternative topsoil and seed. Which alternate is that? Is it numbered yet? I think it's alternate number one. You sure? I'm pretty sure. Shall we just say an additive alternative topsoil and seed? Or in case numbering changes? That's fine. Okay. Mr. Kimmer, are you okay with that? I, I agree with that. Ms. Kowalski? Yes. Okay. Great. Any other comments? All right, any objections to passing the motion as presented? All right, seeing none, that will carry. Thank you very much. No public hearings. Next, Monique Anderson is here to talk to us. Thank you for coming this evening. Sure. I have a handout. Well, thank you for inviting me here tonight. I think this came as a request from Sharon with some discussion maybe on how we can mutually help each other to benefit all of Anchorage's parks and public facilities. So in your packet, the first thing that I wanted to highlight was we had a really great Tree City USA celebration last week. And I wanted to recognize all the work that you're doing in making Tree City USA happen. So I gave you a copy of the program and of the press release. And I think the most important thing I want to emphasize is that Sheila Sell Craig was able to announce that we are officially hiring a municipal forester. Patricia can tell you how many years we've been working towards this, but how many? <laughs> a long time. So we're, we're really excited to have a, a new professional staff. I anticipate giving the hiring process and recruiting from outside, but we'll have them on board maybe by August, September. But maybe we'll be lucky. Okay. So before we get into a discussion, I wanted to start with a little bit of background. I've did come, I think, about two years ago, but there are several new faces on the commission. Uh, I represent Parks and Recreation. I am the superintendent. And overall, our department has a budget of around $20 million, And the horticulture section, for which I oversee, is about a $2 million budget. And within that budget, about 75% goes to labor, all of our employees that you see out working, and 25% covers our vehicle costs, our supplies and operation, our utility costs, things of that nature. And about a million of that goes to our flower production, and a million of it is going towards our, what you see happening in the summer, all of our landscape maintenance for our 150 miles of roadway, over 25 public facilities. Just learned about a new one. And um, let's see. And then, of course, our parks. Let's not forget those. So, our home base is in Russian Jack. Hopefully, you have visited our greenhouse, our tropical house, open seven days a week. I have a permanent staff of 10. And in the winter, they mainly grow all of our annual flowers. We grow over 85,000 annuals and 1,100 hanging baskets. We also do some special events and Christmas tree decorating, things like that. And then in the summer, we swell with some additional staff, about 35, and they are doing tasks, general gardening tasks, as well as operating water trucks and doing mowing type operations. We certainly have more work than we can do. Everyone recognizes that. Um, we have recently split, we have, we've shifted from having split crews to a zone gardening approach. I'll try and explain that a little better. But we used to have crews that were very specific to a certain task. So we would have a crew that showed up to a park and took care of the flowers. And then we would have a crew that would show up to the same park and mow. And then we'd have another crew that showed up and would do any of the tree maintenance. So we've gotten rid of all that and we have zones. 
that are defined by geographic areas, and we have a crew that maintains everything within that zone, but we still do have some specialty service crews that come in if a project is too large for them to handle, or if it requires a very specialized piece of equipment like a gang mower or um, a, you know, any other type of bulldozer or anything like that. Uh, we have eight zones, and within each zone, there's a flagship site. Town Square would be a flagship site, that their zone would be a, a large portion of downtown, but Town Square would be where their major emphasis was. And this has really saved us in transportation costs. It was amazing when we made the shift that the staff actually said they had more time to do things, so that was good. And then there's also some friendly competition on whose site looks the best, and that's always helpful to have, too. So one question that Sharon has been asking me is, we say low maintenance, or we throw out a comment, review comment, low maintenance, this is a low maintenance area, or this is a high maintenance area. What does that actually mean? And so I included in your packet this sheet, and I just wanted to kind of illustrate the types of tasks and what level of service we would be doing that would correlate with our overall denotation of this is high, medium, or low. Um, our core area is really our arterial roads in our downtown area with some very special public facility sites. That constitutes the bulk of our work. The more outlying areas become our low priority areas. And we've got some that kind of fall in the middle into this medium realm. But with only breaking the city into eight zones, it, it does stretch us pretty thin as we are really developing on the south side of town that's a fair distance for us to be traveling. So you will see a repetition in our comments that a lot of those outlying areas are low maintenance and we expect designers or try and communicate to designers that we want them to design that with that in mind. Um, so the next big topic that you have in yours is called the Road Bond o &M. And funding is always a challenge. Um, I did a quick estimate and I was conservative. I just said if we've spent one million a year in increasing our landscape assets, that would be mainly through road projects. Obviously in the past 10 years we've had a net gain of $10 million in assets. Take a wild guess how much our department budget has increased. The big old goose egg. So that's a challenge. And um, but we are taking a great leap forward. And what you have in front of you is something new. We have this pesky thing called a tax cap. But as bonds are passed, there is the potential to add in O&M funding. And so this breaks out by some specific departments. And you'll see the bottom line for us is $500,000 that we've asked for. And when voters approved the road bond in this past April, they've also approved this O&M increase. However, the catch is the assembly actually has to appropriate that dollar amount to our budget. So it's a two-step process. I think you as commissioners will be very helpful to be talking to the political folks that this is important. Because it's great that the voters have approved it, but it doesn't really mean a hill of beans unless it actually does get appropriated to our budget. But that is really exciting to get this far. Any questions so far? I'm moving fast. <laughs> the last two items I included were some sample review comments, and we strive to be consistent and fair and definitely more maintenance oriented than design oriented, and that's hard for me. <laughs> but there's a general theme, and the two examples I have, one is for a municipal project, one's for a state project. I don't think you see state projects. Is that correct, Sharon? Do state projects come through? Only occasionally. Okay. For the most part, we don't see them. Okay. So generally, we try and start our comments with expressing what we feel the priority level of this landscape area is. and. We just try and be upfront so that we communicate that to the designers. It's sometimes great if they call us even before they start. Hey, we're doing a project here. What do you think? Um, we'll like, we'd love to have that conversation. And um, then we usually have our general catch-all things, making sure that we don't conflict with power lines and things that 
we think designers should be doing, but we just have a nice reminder as a professional, please consider these things. Then we do dive into very specific details on the sheets, thing, specific things that we notice that are conflicts. Some of the things that we pick up on are, if we really are going to be mowing a certain area, can we actually take our 72-inch deck lawnmower, which is likely to be used, around some of the tight corners that might be designed? We try and look at it from a practical point of view. Then we also comment on specifications. I'd say our, our special provisions are getting better, and most designers are using those. Um, we still sometimes see the random wire tree staking method, which sometimes surprises us. Whoa, that's not a technique we've liked in the past 10 years. But generally, they're pretty sufficient for most projects. And then the big discussion happens in the maintenance. And what we're trying to do is put a dollar value to the tasks that we're doing. And I think you've started to see these as we submit comments. We usually send the planning staff a record of that. And um, we do work with the designers to maybe fine tune a cost estimate. But we try and come up with the bottom line. What is it really going to cost us on an annual basis to, to maintain this area? And that's very helpful for us when we get asked to put together that O and M for the road bond. Sometimes the timing doesn't work out. We're having to estimate based on the roadway length and what we think would happen. But a lot of times projects are sort of underway before they're um, fully bonded. So that's a municipal project review. Interestingly enough, I think this was on your agenda tonight, Independence Drive, was it? Yeah. And um, this is a unique situation where we gave these comments that it was a low maintenance area, but in actuality, the local community or, or I don't want to use a country club, but they must have a neighborhood group that actually is funding the maintenance. So we won't have any anything to do in this area. But so my comments were a little off base. They didn't tell me that up front. So the next example is a little bit larger and Glen Highway Baga design build. So we've had some challenging rapid turnarounds. But our challenge with state projects, they invest a lot on the capital side, but they never have funding, or they actually physically can't ever give us funding for O&M. And what we've been recommending, but it just has not yet ever happened, and I wanted you to hear this from me, we think a local bond an O and M match for the state's project would be a way to go for us to be able to get money to maintain. But I think you've seen the really significant state projects that have been built over the past couple of years. Elmore Road, we're looking at a Glen Highway redo, this Glen Baga interchange. And this project alone, we've estimated um, $80,000 on an annual year um, for us to maintain. It's a very high intense landscape, very large project. And there's no municipal funding to do this. So who, who can tell what, what will happen? We've tried to design it with there's certain areas where we're going to maintain more than others, and the others are primarily going to be let go. But it's, it's a challenge as we we are really good about doing these capital projects, but we're, we're really lacking on the, the O&M side. So that's basically all I wanted to share. I entertain questions. I, wanted to give you this before we had this discussion, but I think even Sharon has some questions to ask, too. Any questions from Monique? Oh, come on. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, we have a question, uh, the state project widening of Fifth Avenue uh, in front of Barrel Field, mm -hmm. the, uh, for the state facility. Mm -hmm. There was a you know, an opportunity to get landscaping for the reason. There was an opportunity to get landscaping, you know, put in the median, and uh, the state agreed to do that if the municipality uh, took over maintenance. Are you familiar with that project? I am very familiar with that project. And in fact, DOT has a con contractor, I think, on board as part of their bid. It was included the landscaping in the medians. We stipulated that an automatic irrigation system would be included for us to be able to maintain that median landscaping. And um, we've had a little interdepartmental fighting because the irrigation system is underneath the roadway um, 
AWWU is wanting an agreement to maintain that section because it can be very costly if a leak happens. So we're working within the city. But as, all, as far as I know, it, it is all going forward, the landscaping. And uh, do you have a sense of the numbers associated with that? The capital costs? Uh, well, for the, um, you know, uh, particularly interested versus in, um, in, you mentioned before, in, earlier in your presentation, about, you know, a water truck, you know, the different types of right. watering systems, um, and, um, you know, also the, um, uh, uh, so that's the capital side, but also, you know, what you anticipate as an operating, you know, cost for that uh, section. I don't remember the actual number offhand, but since it's a state project, we're going to have to eat it out of our general budget that we have already to maintain that. But if I remember correctly, I think 50000 is probably a rough estimate. It might be less. For uh, maintaining just the landscape. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that um, the drip uh, watering system is a less expensive way of... Uh, of maintaining? It's um, the, um, an automatic drip system in a roadway setting hasn't really been tried, and we worked really hard to get DOT to, to do this as a trial. And the alternative is for us to use water trucks, which requires labor, which requires, we still have to pay for water regardless, but it would also, we can't water at high speeds, so we would have to block traffic for a while. So as we talk to those issues, DOT was more and more supportive of the automatic system. And um, we'll see how it works. Okay. It certainly, it, it does require, I, my department does not maintain the water system. It is another department that does and within the city. And um, so we'll be hearing from them how the winterization and dewinterization and, and head management actually turns out to be. I hope it's relatively easy, but without having a good example in a roadway environment, we'll have to see. I know it, it seems to come up you know, regularly uh, in terms of um, our landscaping. Are they getting adequate, you know, water right. you know, during the summertime? And, and that's Patricia. Water is the best thing you can do for any landscape, especially because of the stresses in an urban environment. But on the flip side, uh, irrigation is very costly to maintain. And this year, when I reviewed over 250 meter assemblies that we had to turn on, I cut back 100 of those. And those 100 I did not connect up were in roadways because they are the quick coupler systems which require us to send staff, tie up ho or hook up hoses, hook up sprinklers, stuff that we never, ever have time to do. So um, I think we have to be very judicious in where we put irrigation. I think we have to make it very meaningful. And I think only some sites are going to be worthy of getting an irrigation system. I think we're going to have to be very, very judicious. So uh, as you're, um, you're making these comments about you know, being judicious, do you have um, uh, are you thinking about developing a set of criteria for to help guide? People are waiting on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're trying to write a white paper. Uh, certainly a lot of our, our more public facilities, places like Town Square, this facility at the library, um, that have the, the built infrastructure around it, um, are some of the places I'd like to start because we spend a lot of time watering in these locations and just go down, down to Town Square on any given day and we have the staff, a couple of staff there, eight hours. Um, roadways are a little bit trickier, but I think that we could look at where are our most high impact landscapes. Um, and then the other consideration is a lot of times if we can get the landscape established, so three, looking at three years, um, we could provide that service with a water truck and then be able to back off. But we would, um, so you might have that phasing of, I'm rambling, but some sites you might just be trying to get the new landscape established and then not be watering as much and, and concentrate on your new landscapes as they get built. But some sites you might have a, assign a super priority to, so you would want to have the infrastructure to continue watering even after the landscape is established. It, typically, now, contractors are required to maintain landscaping for one year? That's a typical municipal standard, yes. Now, did you say three years? Uh, is it something that 
uh, the commission should be looking at in terms of not uh, from a contract perspective but from us we should pay more attention to new uh, new landscapes than our older mature landscapes hmm. in, in that critical phase I, there's been a lot of research that when you plant a tree it's actually takes in our climate about three years before the roots are really establishing into the natural area and Patricia can correct me if I'm wrong on that Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to hog the question. Mr. Briggs. Thanks. Those are great questions. Two questions for you. <clears throat> First of all, just out of curiosity, what was the basis for the development of the prices that you have on the, um, the two uh, projects you included? Huh. A little ingenuity. Now, um, we, have, we have known labor cause, costs, and we've also cross-checked some of them with some industry standards. But um, uh, that's generally how they came up. So you're confident enough, they're generous enough to include all the hidden costs and they're, everything? They're ballpark. You know, I think if you could pick on each single item, but I think lumped together, it generally reflects what it really is. When I look at 80,000, I break that into, oh, how many people is that in over a period of the summer? Yeah, that's about right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for for quick couplers, then, so you recommended they're not used for road projects, but I'm assuming they're still appropriate for soccer field grading? Or they, yeah, there's certainly a place for quick couplers, especially when you have volunteers who might be taking on the maintenance. Um, and I'm thinking we have a lot of quick couplers at our sports fields, and but a lot of our sports fields are even moving towards the automated systems. And um, we have community gardens that it's appropriate to have quick couplers. But we also have uh, little adopted garden places throughout town. So if we have a water, so water system there, um, it's, it's, it would be okay if that was a quick coupler. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a change in thought. It's developing. There's no white paper. We have to do that. I hope I have time this summer. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Joyner. Um, just on the trees, I'd say they're not established even in three years. It's more like six or seven years. It takes three years if you want them to make it at all. And uh, there's problems with all the watering systems, but water trucks are really expensive. And yeah. I expect the people driving them get paid more than the people who deal with the water hoses. And I don't, my experience is they wash the dust off the grass, and that's about it. You spend a whole lot of money to really not benefit anything very much. I know I've stood on, I've stood and watched them go by and then gone and moved yeah. the mulch around yeah. and it didn't even get underneath the mulch. So I don't know, it costs hundreds of dollars for them to drive around and they might as well have stayed home. So, um, And then if there was any way to even get well, contractors I to... I do want to have one comment. We do deep water with our water trucks and I... We have a very nice gadget that you put in the ground and it, and it actually deep waters. And my crew actually get out of their trucks and they do that. Um, and we hire our crew based on their willingness to do that. <laughs> um, but you do see them spraying, they, they use the water trucks to you know, spray down trees in the spring when we have dust. Um, I mean, I agree, it's not the best way, but it's sometimes, if that's all we can do, we're out doing it. Well, it probably happens well sometimes and not as well other times. Right. Um, oh, and the, if, the, if the contract could even be through a growing season, because a lot of times it's for a year and they put them in in May or early June, and then when their year's up, you don't even know really if they made it through the winter. If you could say through a whole growing season, so if it goes in and... Uh, August, they got to go through the next year or get through. Like, so you can add up the months so it comes out to a whole season. Even if you can just push it a few more months, and I understand they want to close out the contract. I think that's pretty typical. I'm looking at the designers, but the terminology is in the special provision of mass is one full growing season because we're looking specifically for the trees to overwinter because that's when the mortality shows up. But then after they've replanted them, back to us. <laughs> yeah. It's not like another four year starts after they've replanted. So it's the game that the contractors play, wait to the last minute, then replace and walk away. Yes, we have challenges. Yeah. Gamer. 
Hey, Monique. <clears throat> so who do we see? Do we come see you at the incept of the project? You know, as these things rocket forward, we start, you know, we'll do our draft DSR and then, and then get comments. But a lot of times I've talked with somebody in parks and rec, and I'll kind of make the assumption that that's covered. So I just want to make sure what the process is. Yeah. It would be best if we were able to work with project management and engineering at the contract side so that those sorts of questions were answered, you know, even at the proposal level, so that does the people who are proposing on projects would even know what they were designing for up front. But certainly give me a call if you have any questions. So the smart thing to do might be to give you a ring when we're... Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, we do see DSR level drawings all the time, and... Um, and that, and that is an appropriate time to shape projects and at least have a discussion. Because we might not know right up front what the community is expecting, and it's, it's all a balancing act. Okay. Anything on uh, moose protection fencing? That's something that always comes up, and, you know, it goes away after a year. And then we've talked, I think, a little bit about extending moose protection into two years. I don't know how that affects your maintenance, if it does yeah. If you guys deal with uh, moose damage, and that's just sort of a residual cost that you accept each year. And there's that debate about how long should it be left up. Um, we, we work with project management and engineering. Within their department, there are two certified arborists who do the inspection services as the new projects are built. They're Brooke Blessing and Isabel Roy. We rely on them to handle everything through that one-year warranty period, and then we do a walkthrough with them if it's a large project and kind of get the inheritance at that point. Um, so it's that's when the moose fencing comes up because they'll ask us, do you want the contractor to leave it on? Do you want them to take it off? So, and we talk through those issues at that point. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And it, we are seeing a difference. I, sh I should have emphasized it earlier on. Having certified arborists who are actually inspecting from the municipality side um, contractors as they're putting in landscape has made a difference. And the single thing that we're trying to correct is the proper planting level. Uh, I think the word's out. Most contractors who've at least worked with us in the past year, they've had to raise hundreds of trees. So we hope they've learned their lesson. Mr. Doherty. I guess I was just kind of piggybacking uh, on the, what Mark was talking about. But if I understand this process, we, we can only really keep the contractor under contractor obligation for a year, right? That's what the engineers tell me is best because they really want to close out the project. If it lasts much longer than that, their attention is gone. But in terms of protecting the community investment, it's good for you to jump in, your people and your resources to come in and, and to help establish that planting for two or three years. And that's part yeah, of Yeah, after the, the warranty plan. is, we don't ever interfere with when a landscape is on warranty uh, because then we're liable for claims that we're now responsible. So it's just, it's after the, after we've accepted the, after the municipality has accepted the landscape, where we recognize that there's still that critical period where the tree is establishing itself, it's not yet free. And um, three years is most critical, and Patricia says longer, of course, the longer the better. So, so for purposes of discussion, contractor takes over for one year, you take over for two more years, and we feel that we have a pretty good success um, opportunity at that point. My question had to do with this, the moose protection, and we've, we've struggled with that. And um, if it goes any longer than a year, it's going to have to be somebody other than the contractor Correct. who's dealing with the moose protection. Yes. Have you had any experience with you taking over the, the moose protection obligation to remove it after two additional years? Or yeah, we, we, we sort we've of had, heard We've it. had a hard time trying to figure out how to give guidance to, mm -hmm. you know, if they're going to invest in the moose protection, we want it to actually do some good. But we realize it's unreasonable. Well, the contractor may not even be in business in three years. Right. Um, so so you actually have some experience where you've taken over the responsibility for That's work. what generally happens. Um, in the past year, we've agreed to leave the, the moose protection fence on, fence on after the landscape 
comes off warranty. So we're inheriting the responsibility to adjust it as needed and then take it down when we feel we're past the threat. Have you done that yet? Um, I'd say most, we've not removed much because it seems the trees have to get quite big before we feel they're safe. But the risk is if we're not in the area all the time, the fencing can lean over and cause other safety issues, which we're responsible for. It's a risk we take. Yeah. And we had a clean uh, last year. That got spooled up into a snowblower over on Muldoon. It was oh, yeah, that's like the one we had, yes. a real interesting <laughs> uh, situation for yeah. the operator. Muldoon is not a good example because we never accepted that from the state. It's in Lumber Lamb. Yeah. If you, if you were, I'm, you know, assuming that we're writing a specification that we want to hold contractors to, it hasn't ever been clear to me why we see moose protection fencing on some projects and not on others. Um, so I'm assuming that that doesn't appear in your specification right now as a, as a mandatory requirement. Uh, we kind of leave, leave that to the designers, but if we know it's a, a moosey area, we'd certainly recommend it in our comments. And I, I guess we're just accepting that most likely after the warranty period is done that we'll ask for it to be remained up and then it's our responsibility to and take that. you're okay down. with that? I think that's fine. Okay. Ms. Ferguson. Yes, I had a question going back to um, the issue of automated irrigation. And if we were to leave aside cost for a moment, are there other technical reasons why at this point automated, automated automated irrigation is still a problem. I know Mark and I have talked on the phone and there's all sorts of new ways to do that. There, I mean, you could sit in a computer at, at your office and turn the sprinklers on and off, but of course there's money associated with buying that program. But then Mark also mentioned that you can, you know, your staff could drive by with a little remote control kind of device, turn it on and turn it off. So I just wanted kind of more discussion about the, you know, where you all are in your discussion and of exploring, you know, that type of irrigation system. Right. Uh, we have, well, we have a very old system at City Hall probably 20 years ago, but it is a pop-up um, system. Yep. I wouldn't say, the technology has advanced so much since that time that you can't even compare it. Uh, the most recent example I've had on Parkland is an automated system at a ball field area, and it's a battery-operated system, and uh, once you've set the timer for when you want it to water, it pretty much runs itself. Um, the Little League complained that the grass grew too fast for them, <laughs> which, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> but they had to adjust their mowing schedule to keep up with the additional irrigation. And um, that's kind of one of the newer examples that I'm familiar with. But this is a whole industry that has advanced a lot in the lower, lower 48. And there's now, I think, a, a quite a few contractors who are bringing that sort of expertise up. And um, the other example that I'm aware of is the cemetery project, which I don't actually maintain. The funny story on that one is they're digging a well this year because they couldn't pay their water bill. <laughs> so we have to be prepared. We, as a department, have to pay for our water, too. We have to pay AWW, and we have to project what is going to be the cost if we really are watering sites. We have to build that in our budget as well. But um, that was kind of surprising. But, yeah, they, they couldn't afford their bill. But is there a reason why we're not going in that direction? We are, um, and it's, I think it's critical to choose the right projects to test this on because this town is, if you try it and you fail, it will never be tried again. So I really wanted to do Town Square this summer, but our bond funding is pretty well spent now on bricks. But, um, you know, I think that's, that's where this type of technology should be employed, is where we spend a lot of labor already and that they're high maintenance zones already that we know they need the care. I'm not as interested in doing trials on some landscape areas that are on the periphery that will never really reap the benefits. But, I mean, I have incredible staffing down at Town Square that could be cut by a quarter if we were able to automatically irrigate that. 
Mr. Kaplan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, a couple questions. Um, I guess one, just following up on uh, the most recent comments, uh, having an, a you know intelligent you know landscaping you know system. Um, there, there are opportunities uh, there. Uh, the uh, you know the feds FHWA um, you know does have a uh, a program uh, ITS that is funded every year, uh, and um, you know, we also have a, a transportation research uh, program uh, that's housed out of uh, uh, UAF uh, that um, gets about a three million dollars a year budget. Constant. They're regularly looking for. Uh, ideas, uh, research uh, projects, research uh, proposals uh, for um, that benefit the streetscape uh, and, uh, road environment, and that um, the idea of doing the legwork uh, in terms of sort of a prototype of an intelligent landscaping system using some of the technologies that were mentioned, um, and really has I think you know an there's an opportunity there. I know that you're short, you know, it requires some you know, staff to mm -hmm. kind of do it, but I just want to mention it as a, uh, that money could be available um, you know, to pursue that. So the other thing was the um, information on uh, hardscape landscaping. You know, we've talked a lot about sort of the, you know, the trees and watering the, tr the trees, but um, you know, we also see as part of the, our landscaping fences, um, you know, we're seeing, you know, more sort of gateway elements. Uh, and um, so when something is installed, like, for example, the, um, you know, a gateway element, like in, in Fairview at that 15th one. Now, is that maintained by you uh, or is that maintained by someone else? Unless you want it maintained by a street grader, it's maintained by us. In um, it's an area that we've just sort of inherited because there's no other department that's really designated to do it either. And the best that we're able to do is when we take down the broken fence panels and we annually try and piece together um, and get things repaired by, by doing little fabrication um, purchase requests. But it, it is a trouble. We don't have a good comprehensive system and I have seen the increase which is really nice. Um, most things are designed well and durable, like the Fairview Gateway. You know, unless a car runs into it and really destroys it, or probably have to be a semi. Um, they're all fairly durable pieces of equipment. Fencing is more troublesome because we rarely ever are able to. We're missing getting the actual um, asphalts and having them on file and being organized enough to say, oh. This fence in this area and is broken, and we need ten more panels and pull up a file. We're not that organized, so it requires us kind of doing some basic measurements and walking down to a fabricator and saying, "Hey, can you do this?" And so we have been commenting on some designs that we have this pretty basic standard. If it's not needed to be really fancy, the Spinard road fence, that little green wood post job, that's fairly easy for us to repair. The other one that's fairly easy for us to repair is the 15th Avenue kind of model. But I know as designers, everyone, everyone wants a unique type of fence for the roadway to set it across, but it is difficult on the maintenance side because when things get broken, you're looking at a custom job every time to repair it, and that's hard. Well, um, we reviewed like Piper Street uh, between Tudor just north of Tudor, over there by Providence, you know, hospital. And uh, part of the landscaping you know, elements there, they had some significant uh, hardscape, uh, you know, vertical elements uh, in terms of the, the uh, portals, pedestrian sort of mm -hmm. portals uh, and the like. So now uh, those would be things that you maintain, right? You get ownership of what, what would happen would be a complaint would come to the city no one would know who to send it to. It would eventually come to us, and then we, you know, get a call from the mayor's office, fix it. Um, <laughs> we're not out there in front saying, yes, this is ours to maintain, but it usually works its way our direction when we have to deal with it. Uh, with budget increases, I think we could do much better. And what I was saying before, how we had a big old goose egg increase, I think we could develop a pretty good, sophisticated, hardscape repair program. 
but we're, we're just not, we're not there yet. Uh, just trying to get a, a, you know, a, a better sense of, um, you know, we're looking at vertical elements, whether they are the, you know, the fencing, the gateways, or the portals, um, and versus, you know, those are inanimate, you know, mm -hmm. objects versus your trees, which are, you know, animate need. Just trying to get a sense of um, uh, scale in terms of maintenance uh, commitment. You know, which um, is it? Um, you know, less expensive on an annual basis to maintain uh, those uh, vertical hardscape uh, elements, uh, or the uh, other? You know, the trees and the more you know animate you know elements. I've never really analyzed that. Um, I'd say, I mean, obviously, if it's inanimate, it shouldn't require a lot of care on an annual basis. But the cost comes in is when it gets damaged. And in roadways, it will get damaged. Cars run off the road all the time. I'm really surprised every year after the snow melts, as we take a look around, we're like, a car went here? Um, it's, it's just amazing. So if it's in a roadway, it's likely to get damaged. And what we always react very quickly on is we can't have a health safety issue out there. So we will remove it. If it's a health safety issue, whether we place it or not, that's a great question. Depends on budget. Thank you, sir. Ms. Joyner. Well, just on that, it seems odd to me, really, that with 10,000 acres of parkland and a small budget and a small staff, that things like car damage to streetscape goes to the Parks Department, I would think the mayor should call the street department and say, a road you put in has an issue that's a health safety thing and you get to take care of it. But I mean, Sometimes they help. Yeah, me, the whole great. road thing seems mm -hmm. to me it's part of that capital transportation thing and right. it's odd to me that it right. goes to parks, but I don't know, that's another issue. Well, I used to laugh just when I started at Parks and Recreation, um, park maintenance was in the streets department and we maintain parks and recreation, maintain the roadways. So yeah. just a little backwards. But they have a much bigger budget. Um, and then two other things. One was on the moose fencing. I know some um, people that are planting trees on private property and some of the landscape architects, they're just going to bigger trees and get out of that fencing because the fencing's ugly and it causes problems. And I don't know if it's cheaper, so it might be worth analyzing the cost for what if we increase the tree caliper by an inch and don't put moose fencing in in some instances. I don't know, but it could be the cost would come out the same and they'd have it be done with all that ugly and but somebody may have looked at it, but I know some people maybe they just have more money or just planting bigger trees and avoiding mm -hmm. it. And then the third one was I think you said on the bonds where you've had money put in and the public voted for maintenance cost on parks, did are you saying the assembly did not appropriate the money to you in the past? Well, we did that last year on our parks bond. And um, so in 2007, we had a four or $5 million park bond. And we had the O&M funding in that. When we went through the budget process last fall, we got partial of the O&M funding that the voters approved. But we have a brand new assembly. They have since appropriated the rest to us. Um, what's new is that through the road bond process that there is a category now called parks and we've defined what those costs are. So that is new. Before we left it up to the road engineers to decide what that amount was and I think we got maybe, they might have put $5,000 in, you know, just there. Oh, it doesn't cost much. Is, Which, the, is the reason for the two-step process because of uh, um, some policy against earmarking funds? I can't answer. Uh, well, I think because the bonds have to be voter approved, it's the tax cap, and I probably can't say it well enough. There is a tax cap, and what has to happen is that the assembly has to appropriate additional money above the tax cap, and that's where the issue becomes political, because politicians like to be fiscally responsible. But we know the public says all the time we should be maintaining what we're doing and wants that money to go in. And I think the public would be very dismayed in large majority to think we passed a bond 
thinking things that are going to get built are going to get maintained, and then the assembly didn't put the money to where we voted for it to go. Uh, but, and that's it for me. It's a community challenge. We, we're, I think, a little spoiled in Anchorage. Mr. Camplin. I just want to follow up a little bit on, uh, on, on the money to the side. Um, and your money, you, you said the, you know, the bonds for, um, um, it's for kind of you know, initial capital. Uh, you have a maintenance dollars in there and that's a two step. In our park bond, yes. Right. Yes. So, um, and your regular operating, you know, funds, uh, you know, does that come out of property taxes? Yes. The general fund? Mm -hmm. So, um, and has there been uh, any discussion about uh, other uh, you know, funding sources other than you know, the property tax. I hope you are familiar with the Anchorage Park Foundation. I am familiar with. Uh, They've Anchorage. raised over ten million dollars in private dollars for Anchorage Parks. And uh, now is that capital or capital and operating? It is capital only at this point. It's very difficult in to raise money for operating. People like to give money for specific things. Where I guess the Park Foundation Board is looking to change how they accept money in the future so that they are getting O and M funding as part of the initial gift. Okay. Has there been any discussion with the uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, uh, about supporting the uh, the wildlife? <laughs> well, it's uh, tourism is a very big uh, component of our um, our local economy. Uh, they come to look at the, a, an attractive, you know, urban uh, area, and and they send people on our bike trails, stay an extra day. Yeah, you get it. We we have approached them. Um, they've had some change in leadership. We didn't get a an, a real audience back. I think a year or so when we approached, but it's, it is always a possibility. What could the Urban Design Commission do for you? Uh -huh. I think it's going to be very important for the budget revision for you to know this information that we have $500,000 at stake and I, th I think with this nicer, kinder assembly that um, they, they have already made good on what voters approved last fall um, and it took getting some new members in to do that. So I think they're going to be receptive to appropriating this money to the budget but I definitely wanted you guys to know that because it, I think it will be important for you to, to share that with the elected officials, that you're, that you're supportive of it. And that budget revision occurs when? I think it will be in the fall. I will certainly let all of you know when it's a good time to start talking. So the, uh, one action item perhaps for commission members to be thinking about is drafting maybe a resolution um, of support for um, uh, the appropriation uh, of those funds to uh, the That'd be great. And we can help you with some of the wording for that when the time is right. So just want to mention that as a seed to my you know, commission members. Mr. Briggs, are, are we as a commission allowed to do something like that? I believe we are. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'm exhausted. Anything else for money? Very enlightening. Appreciate you coming out. Sure, sure. Um, I'm trying to think if I had any other random thoughts. Yeah, we're really excited to have an urban forester. Um, it will relieve a lot of load off of me. I'm trying to do a lot of jobs. But I think they're going to bring such a, a good perspective that is missing here. Um, we really don't know the composition of different species around town. Um, we're doing the best we can, but I think having an, an urban forester guiding the larger vision will will help in that regard. I appreciate all the work that you're doing too, Mr. Briggs. For the urban forester, will that be a permanent position, or is it serving at the, you know, is it appointed, or how does it work? It's a full-time permanent position. Perfect. Yes. All right. Thanks again. Yeah. Reports. Sharon, you have anything for us? No, I don't have anything. Um, and nor do I. Anybody have any updates on um, one percent art committees? Two. 
Yes, Mr. Nia. We are um, now working through the 1% for the new paratransit uh, building. In, uh, Which building? In transit, uh, para okay. handicap, uh, yeah. correct? We have a meeting last week, and we are going to have a second meeting tomorrow and try to decide what to have. Any others? Peter, anything on the Sustainable Building Initiative? Update there? Um, we're in the process of getting letters of support. We have one from AIA, um, one from ASLA, and uh, just working our way through to uh, get our ducks in a row for introducing it to assembly. I have a meeting with the mayor in a few weeks. Um, so uh, almost through the pre-political process. It's amazing how long these things take. It's incredible. I've learned so much. And what about um, Winter City discussion? Any comments from our presentation earlier? Or does everyone just want to go home at this point, <laughs> Mr. Brick? If it's available, if it's possible to request from Tom, he had those publications from other areas. I'd be interested in seeing if we could get duplications or duplicates of those. If you can scan them, get a digital copy, not to waste paper, just so we can review to see what other information there is. So I'm curious as to um, what sort of a task it would be to develop a document for Anchorage. I'm a bit wary of the UDC taking on the whole concept. It'd be great if there was staff time available, but. Perhaps it's just as easy as borrowing from some other areas. Well, and I mean, if I was catching the subtle message he was throwing out there, there's some question as to whether we should even be doing it because the whole point is to blend as much of those principles into the to the two core uh, uh, development plans and the Title 21 rewrite as possible. I think my question early on about where we stood on this was how much of that information still remained in the current document because things have ebbed and flowed as it's made its way through the political process. Yeah, e even if that information was embedded in each of the chapters or, you know, each of the paragraphs, I, I think there might be some benefit to having a Winter Cities guideline um, just so that it's, uh, it's clear to people. One of the things I thought was uh, a little bit odd was the lack of clarity in terms of what the new title was striving to accomplish um, as a as a community direction, and you know one of the things that we heard when we asked this question was that we wanted to to really get Winter City design standards in. But I think it'd be good to to maybe highlight with a special chapter or a supplement that talks about what is written into each of these chapters, um, because in some cases it's it's subtle and doesn't necessarily come across as Winter City design. So. Well, and, uh, and there's a couple things that that and I was a little I have to be honest was a little reluctant to think of coming here at five o'clock to see this presentation now for probably realistically five times that I've gone through it I mean Tom does a great job but you know that fifth time re reiterated again that I think we're talking we're using the wrong labels here um, and I do like the emphasis put on a northern city as opposed to winter city design because I agree with the point he made that if you if you take a look at how you make good outdoor spaces um, for use in our climate in the summer, you probably have, have addressed a lot of the battle to making it usable in the winter. And I, I think that's a pretty good focus to put on there. But I also like Tom's idea of taking this guy that you're talking about and putting it in perhaps this appendage, uh, appendix that deals with, you know, submittal procedures and so forth. It says, hey, this is an example for how some of these things might be implemented. Um, and I think, you know, Mr. Kemplin's point of um, consider presenting as part of your submission um, a view or, or a rendering at, of a winter um, depiction of your of your scheme. Uh, address things like, what are you going to do with, with snow removal? Are you going to put it in a pit or are you mounting it up in a dedicated snow storage area? Um, because it is easy to over, you know, to, to not think about those when we're seeing a summerscape presentation all the time. Um, but I guess... I'd be reluctant for us to take on our own vision of what this document could be, given what I heard today. That could just be me. Am I wrong here, Mr. Campbell? I'll quickly jump up. <laughs> so it, I, I've, I've uh, heard um, you know, Mr. Davis has been seen his presentation a number of times before, uh, and um, as a um, you know, he, he comes at it from a, a, you know, a good planner's you know, perspective, but 
and it, he uh, uh, speaks to, you know, the examples that he gave were, you know, of the downtown plan and the midtown plan, you know, planning documents. Um, and, you know, the, the challenge that we have, I, I think, you know, in terms of the uh, UDC, a lot of the examples he gave indeed were of, um, you know, good urban form, uh, but he um, doesn't, um, you know, really address um, the, the uniqueness that uh, our metropolitan area has uh, in, uh, because of its latitude. Uh, and, you know, you know it's this uh, duality uh, of, of climate uh, extremes that, that really calls out for um, a double approach uh, to things. Uh, and, um, you know, six months of winter uh, is, you know, it really requires a sort of a, a different set of, of, of design uh, 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 approaches um, to kind of move beyond just enduring you know, that period of, of the year to actually celebrating it uh, as you know, really you know, mature people of the North. Uh, and um, when you look at um, you know, these design guidelines and the, and the documents that he's um, you know, showed, um, you know, the approach that they typically, have, what they typically take uh, is um, you know, at a larger uh, uh, level, uh, and they just give their, their uh, efforts to you know, educate the, the, uh, both the general citizenry but, and, and the layman, but also you know, design uh, you know, professionals, um, building professionals, um, about you know, what, you know, what, is, is a, what is a winter city, what makes this particular place different. Um, because we have a, uh, you know, a number of uh, developers that come up, you know, from the lower 48. You know, they they build for a lower 48 market, uh, and um, you know they don't readily understand or readily grasp the, uh, the uniqueness of a uh, of an anchorage that's at the same latitude as you know Oslo, and the importance. I, I think of having the, you know, the, um, the UDC participate in helping to uh, at least give a, 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 you know, a basic framework of what the characteristics, you know, uh, that we should be looking at that are specific to you know, our latitude and the challenges from a design perspective that we face would be a very useful, very useful document. Patricia. Oh, quickly, I just want to encourage everybody to look at the editorial in the newspaper this morning. Monique mentioned the Tree City Award, and the editorial today is a letter to the National Arbor Day Foundation that gives the award, asking if they graved on a curve, because if you look around Anchorage, they wonder why we get an award when it's um, with private development standard operating procedures to bulldoze every speck of vegetation from lot line to lot line. Trees are treated as nothing more than big weeds that just get in the way. And it's a, it's a scathing but humorous editorial. I was happy to see, actually, so you should all take a look at it. Yes, if you haven't read it, I, I encourage you all to get the paper and read it. It's quite funny. Ms. Josephson. Yeah, um, back to the Winter City thing. The thing he seemed to emphasize was not, um, it was just very simple, not about winter so much as just what makes a good walking city. And that's, I think, what we can, um, I mean, we're already doing a lot of that well here, more and more. And I think it, that's maybe the best way to, um, achieve all of these goals without being too trendy or gimmicky, which I fear sometimes is uh, um, maybe like happens too easily. Um, and also walkability, talking about sustainability is something we should be trying to encourage. And when we um, talk about the metrics of heating the sidewalk or any of that also, like we were talking about before, I think the metric should include um, private 
you know, gas saved if, if people are just parking once and walking around, you know, even if it may cost the city more, the overall cost and environmental cost. You know, I don't know if we, there would be some way to, um, you know, estimate that and pencil it out or something, but that would be another um, dimension to include. Mr. Briggs? And within our discussions as well, I think we should recognize the petitioners that are before us, you know, Dwayne Adams, Terry Schoenthal, Kevin Denier, all these designers very well respond to uh, our winter cities, our northern climates questions, um, and often the responses they give do address, you know, sort of the pedestrian, you know, how people use the site, um, sort of the, the larger sort of cultural context. The, um, I was just in Quebec City as well, which was a pretty fascinating place. But the biggest stumbling block, I think, for Anchorage in most uh, North American communities to develop good northern cities, whether it's South Dakota, Minnesota, us, um, you know, northern Canada, is the cultural component of it, is that people don't want to walk, and there are all these issues. So for us, it, it seems like right now there are the opportunities within the planning context for the midtown plan, the downtown plan, to um, get the framework and the blocking in place that then some of the smaller elements will suddenly develop on their own. And one of the, the most uh, enlivening aspects for Quebec City was that uh, there's nothing necessarily that special except that the touches the businesses put on each of their own, um, oh, on their own buildings and the fact that they had bought into the community enough that they wanted to attract people there by having beautiful entrances, working collaboratively on the roadscape. So it's just investing the businesses into the concept as well, rather than just creating this, uh, you know, a sort of a planned mentality of we'll provide it and then you guys can just use it. And you have to invest and buy into it. I think that's a hard thing for us as a commission is to, uh, you know, in initiate a cultural shift, even though I think that we are trying by the questions that we ask and uh, hopefully rewarding the petitioner by thanking them when they do good and, and, and that sort of thing. But uh, it's, it's a cultural context. I tend to agree, and I think the, um, the challenge for whatever it is we do is, is um, how we can implement it. That's always the tough part. And I think in order to have success in implementing it, we have to be realistic about things. Like you mentioned, half the population of our town um, still drives to work alone. You know, I do. Um, I try to ride a bus. That's a different discussion. And, you know, mass transit hasn't caught up with that desire. Uh, fuel prices are going to help in, in some of that. But we do have a, a particular cultural mindset that I think we have to be aware of to gain success in how we make this, this shift that you're describing. And that's probably the, the biggest concern I have in us diving into this topic at all. Um, because to me, if I, as a designer, if I was to start on a project and say, all right, I want to look at my project in terms of how it can contribute in, 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 in a downtown setting and be a good winter you know, or northern city design solution, the question I would ask myself is, how do I get people on the street? How do I, how do I get people to want to, to sit on that park bench that he took a photo of and nobody was there? If they're not sitting on that park bench, why aren't they? And ask that question because that's the key to me to making it viable is people wanting to be a part of it. Um, but that's and my take on it. They, Go ahead. And, and to speak to the cultural issues, uh, an excellent thing was brought up was, you know, how does ACVB fit into the planting aspects? Um, the, if I got the acronym right, the Convention Visitor Bureau. It, you know, it would be a brilliant thing if one year they offer a $5,000 prize for the best decorated winter business. And that's the way you get a cultural shift. You get a bunch of people doing it, and you just encourage uh, them to do it until the point where the community expects it. So maybe that's another way to uh, do some guerrilla northern city warfare. Sure. Yes. Um, to the issue of asking the petitioners to submit sort of a winter rendering of their project, you know, we've asked for that in the past, and we've got it a couple of times, and I'm not sure how useful that is because most often all it amounts to is a rendering with, and they show snow on the ground and some snowflakes in the air, and the people in the picture are wearing coats. It really doesn't amount to anything more than that, and it's, of course, not helpful. And I'm not sure what, sh what sort of thing that we should ask for when we want to understand and, and you know, be confident that they really have addressed the winter issues, and I don't know if that's in the design details we're asking to see a certain something, or but it just bears more thinking about it by, I think, all of us to try and come up with what do we really want to see or what do we need to see and how to ask for that. Um, 
Well, I think it also begs the other question that I've been wrestling with in terms of how much of, of, uh, of a role we play in this is what are we, at the end of the day, when we have this all figured out and it's on a page, what are we doing? Are we requiring a certain thing? Are we making a recommendation, pointing people in, in a direction we believe is uh, a positive one for our community? Just exactly what is our goal? Well, I was asking that question in reference to the rewrite of Title 21. What specifically can we ask for and want to see? And yeah, what, you know, what is that? Yes, because I think if we're going to do this, we have to be very clear about how it plugs in at that level. Or it'll just be more words. Yeah. Well, just uh, you know, one thing that comes to mind um, you know, is you know, we are tasked with um, you know landscape you know review and you know small uh, review of small scale you know, site plans, and so uh, for landscape uh, you know review, I think what would be appropriate is uh, you know for us to uh, ask to see um, you know how does that streetscape what's it going to look like. Um, you know, in a wintertime, you know, environment. Um, so uh, the, if the shrubbery is going to be, you know, covered with snow, right, then you know, the, uh, the impact of that, you know, landscaping is only going to be prevalent, you know, for the non-winter time of the year. And so if it's going to be not there, should there be more vertical elements, you know, included as part of that streetscape, you know, environment that, uh, so that you get the, uh, aesthetic impact of landscaping during that period of the year when uh, it's dark uh, and, and uh, when there's significant amounts of snow you know, on uh, the ground covering up you know, a lot of the foliage. I was whether thinking... it's, that's you know, lights in the trees or whether it's bollards that are lit or whether it's you know, color elements that are you know, uh, integrated as part of it, uh, as part of the, you know, the streetscape um, uh, landscaping. I mean, those are the type of things that you'd be looking at from a landscaping perspective with a winter, you know, rendering uh, is recognizing that things change during winter and how do we still accomplish what we're trying to uh, do with the landscaping ordinance, which is to enhance the streetscape environment. How do we do that in the wintertime conditions? They could cover that in a rendering, but my thought was something that goes beyond that that's more on a functional design detail basis that we're looking for. And that's kind of where I don't know where to go on that. Uh, as, a, as, as a landscape architect who, uh, you know, prepares renderings and such, I, I would, as a commissioner member, would be very dubious of a, of a winter rendering for the fact that the conditions during the winter are so variable um, as to what you choose. And even in an office, if you're having an uh, entry-level person doing a rendering, they're going to show the shrub poking up through the snow because it looks better. And there's going to be these things to try and convince you to this image. So it would be hard to do kind of a quantitative winter rendering. So I think that's the point where we come in as commissioners, because if we're looking at a, uh, a product, we can say to them, well, your light feature is only 16 inches tall. It's going to be buried by snow. And so then we can provide the, the, that filter to things. A, a winter render component would be difficult for the render in the first place just from a, uh, from a functional point of view um, in order to try and capture the true winter essence. So I think it requires more so of a, an interp interpretation and a re requirements or recommendations on our part um, because I would be worried. Somebody taught me a long time ago when you do a perspective drawing, you better draw it right because that's what you're going to be judged upon when the product is built. If a person does a nighttime winter rendering of their project, then we should expect that we go out there when it's finished and it looks exactly like they've drawn it. And I don't have the skills, nor do I know many people that would have the skills to do that because there's so many variables for a winter landscape. And I appreciate the intent, but I just think that it would be so, so difficult that we have to find other ways to have quantitative measurements like heights and colors and the things we've talked about before. That's why you appeal to the creative the talent of our professional landscape architects. But creative talent doesn't necessarily equal truth. That's my issue, is that a creative drawing will not be something upon which we can measure it. Ms. Kowalski. Uh, I want to know, does the commission have any interest in pursuing discussion with Tom? He, I, what I heard tonight is he volunteered to go over Winter City in these documents. I was unaware of some of those documents that he had, so I'm definitely interested in that. So I'm going to do that myself. Does the commission want to be involved? 
I'm willing to set that meeting up. Well, I volunteer. And, and don't we have a, a, a request on the floor to get copies of those documents Correct. electronically? Correct. I mean, I'm not suggesting, based on my pre previous comment, that that this subcommittee, if you will, on winter city design issues should just cease and desist. I'm just um, – I've always been concerned about what our, what our end goal was going to be. And I guess all, all I'm saying is perhaps it should be – uh, at this time, less focused on providing a document um, and more in in terms of following a, a process of learning and thinking and so forth so we can determine what it should be. Um, that probably sounds looser than it. I, I would agree with that. But that uh, CB Central Business District document that he showed, I actually worked with that on Tundra Tikes downtown, and it's sort of a point system. I think it was based on building square mm -hmm. footage and, you know, a tree is worth so many points, a bench is worth so many points, and you kind of found yourself in this uh, game of, okay, well, if I add one more, I can add a bench here, and I've got it, you know, but really is that right? So I think it is going to be more of a learning process and probably. And I, and I would like to see that because, I mean, I, I pointed out the, the Office Depot project when that slide came up, and I say the same thing every time I see that slide. Yeah. Um, because those elements that were applied onto that wall uh, – were, were picked to play the game that you just described mm -hmm. in the current bonus point system that we have. And so if, if we're going to have a new way we're looking at downtown core, I would want to get involved with it from this perspective to see is it really providing a helpful vehicle for people to, to do those things, or does it become more like the kind of checklist that could end up with an office depot? And precisely the bench at the Marriott that Yes, Tom said. No That's why it's there. I'm, I'm almost no doubt. certain it was yeah. part of that process. There's, there's no doubt. There's not enough meat in the thing to suggest how that bench gets done well yeah. and is more successful. And that's what I would be concerned about. Francis, uh, thank you. Um, it seems to me that that creating a, a great pedestrian pedestrian environment, um, in large, you know, a, a big component of that is. Um, the landscaping, uh, um, it's a part of the physical environment. Um, you know, if you don't have um, certain components, the, this commission still has um, a role in reviewing plans for, for the landscaping. So if you can't get it site plan, you can still get it in landscaping. And so as far as creating, um, a, you know, a, you know, a, a year-round pedestrian environment, um, this commission has direct control over reviewing on the landscape plan. So without doing anything creative and new, you can ju just trust your own judgment to um, regarding requirements for um, the size, type, and uh, number of um, plantings. That's all. Mr. Neal. Well, I guess um, my thinking is, first of all, we need to, I would say, educate the designers. Here, so far, they have be challenge they have to be facing this problem and no one has never asked them to really to start thinking about the winter design on the drawings on the proposal. If they know they, 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 they can be expecting questions for us, they can be expecting some challenge from us about their approach, you know, as long as only I think they will get the message. And sometimes even we can put some conditions on their on, on our approval of the design. The problem is I think so far no one but the people coming here is having faced this reality. We, you know, we are trying to go towards that because sometimes it's more expensive, sometimes it's more money, and more, ta more time and more design. So, but I think our designs are good enough to, to face this challenge. So if they are aware that we are going or we want to go towards that direction, I think they will start coming with solutions and designs. And as long as lonely, I think we can start mentalize people that, yes, we, it is time for us to change our direction. That's that why they are coming here. So I think it's up to us to start directing them you know, towards that path that we want them to go. Mr. Doherty. Well, that's a very slippery slope, I think. Um, and, and one of the things that I've always advocated, having been in the petitioner's seat a few times, is 
I think there has to be a certain amount of predictability for developers in this town that want to do new things. And I don't think it's reasonable for them to be subject to every whim that's not documented. I think people need to have some guidelines that are expected of them and that we will make sure that they follow those guidelines. But for each of the individual commission members to impose their own standards on the, on the petitioners, I think that's one absolutely surefire way to get this commission disbanded. Um, you know, we need to find ways to work with them. And one of our charters is to make recommendations to the mayor on issues of design. Um, so that if we feel strongly about northern design or winter design and we don't think that the current regulations that we have in place are strong enough or address enough issues, then we can assume an advocacy role to make sure that this gets documented. So there is a clear path for the petitioners to follow. But I, I am absolutely opposed for this to be like some sort of free-for-all where everybody says, I think you should plant twice as many trees when there's no guidance for the petitioner in the codes that are written for them to, to do that. Um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fine line. I think we can make recommendations, and I think we have a good track record of making recommendations of things that we think that will enhance the designs. But as far as holding them to, the, to a higher standard than what the regulations require, I think that would be very troubling and would lead to delays and extra costs and lots of frustration that we spent years trying to sort of ease so that we develop more of a partnership with the petitioners to raise the standards but sort of in a nudging way uh, and not coming across as arbitrary and capricious, I think, were um, and I guess the that's words that were... I guess that's somewhat the point I was trying to get at over, you know, a winter rendering kind of that whole issue. I can see us um, having a petitioner come forward, and they've they've got this requirement to show us what the scape is going to look like in the winter. We might view it and say, well, you know, it would be better with more vertical elements. If our purpose for wanting this is for us to have an authority to require a certain kind of element, that's the point I think we ought to be very clear about up front so that the guidance to the petitioner that you're talking about is there. I think we need to be very clear about what our goal is. Is it to, to shore up more standards, specific standards, that should be in place for a proper northern city design solution, or is it to be more recommendation-based? And I think that's a fundamental starting point. Well, and I think we're in a, a, a somewhat of a unique position in that we see lots of proposals come through here that are suggesting the direction that the city is moving. So we're able to gain a perspective of many projects that are developed. And if we see that uh, irrigation is not properly addressed or moose protection is not properly addressed in, in the standards and codes that we have, and I think it's well within our guidance to have discussions like this and make a formal recommendation to the planning department or the assembly or to the mayor to get better regulations in place that will assure a higher standard of urban design. Um, and, you know, we haven't spent as much time as a commission on that aspect of the making recommendations aspect. We've, we've spent most of our time simply reviewing the projects that come in from the, from the petitioner. But I, I do think that if we want to see, and that's why I was saying that it was difficult for me to get my arms around the whole Title 21 idea because there weren't, at least the first draft that came around, there weren't expressed goals that the city was trying to achieve. Specific things where our community fell short and we felt that we could do better by rewriting the code. It was, well, the code is confusing, it's hard to use, uh, those kinds of things, but not in terms of a specific design direction that, that was eventually clarified that, that with regard to winter or northern design, they did want to capture some sort of unique aspect of Anchorage. But our commission can do a lot, and I think Alan has, has led the charge in sort of asking us, how can we best help the community and what are the issues that we can stand behind to really advocate? Um, and, you know, and then we take that message to people who can make the regulations clear or participate in Title 21 rewrites to make sure that that's clear. But I'm, you know, I just 
I want to make sure that I'm on record um, cautioning everybody to not decide to hold people to a higher standard than what the regulations require from them um, because that that's a surefire way to have a lot of political backlash against this committee for um, moving in the wrong direction instead of the right direction. So, Mr. Neal. Well, what I'd like to say is uh, I don't think we should impose them, you know, our ideas or our way of seeing things, but we can challenge them to make sure that what they were designed that has an effect in wintertime. It's not only you know, plants, you know, they don't, when, when there's no comes in, no, you don't see anything anymore. They're spending money only for three or four months. But you start you know, using other elements, the other elements of design, you know, really make the same design a little nicer in wintertime, more, more, more appealing to people. Because if the idea is to have people on the street, you have, people need to have a reason to be there. Reason walking on the street to see on is no, they will never be there. They have, you no, know, they, they have something, something like life, something that really, it's pleasant to be there, or even walking through there. That's what I'm saying. You know, because here, the only many thing we see is plants, plants lately. We are seeing an element visible in winter and make it winter more alive and a happy winter. That's what I'm saying. You know, but the only thing and, and I'm I trying to say is to challenge them. You know, okay, have you, have you never thought about how we look in winter time? But there's simple things like that. You know? And I, I'm no, I think we have brought that. I think we have brought those issues to to the different petitioners' attention. And I think the, the distinction I was trying to make is that, and I think we've been pretty successful at really recommending better design when we see the designs fall short. What I would hate to see is for us to start writing in recommendations. Recommendation number two: you need to put um, you know light fixtures along your uh, your walkways. Um, when the code wouldn't require that, um, and 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 that's where I, I get I get troubled, and and I don't think that we've been doing that actually. No. But I, I I don't think we should do that. I think we should help to improve their design. That's what I'm saying, but they're the designer, not us. So we're here just to review and to make sure that the city gets a good value. That's what I'm saying. Well, I'm sure we'll have many more opportunities to discuss it. But if Jill, if you want to maybe touch base with Tom and see. If it makes more sense to have the group sit down and meet with them some more or um, try to get copies of the documents that he has in play, I mean, either way is, is probably fine. Speaking to fewer meetings is good if we can review things digitally and sort of teach ourselves and then well, I would then tend to come agree with that, together. but I don't want to lose momentum of the, of the effort either. So. Anything else? And, you know, I've seen that presentation five times, but he does keep working on it, and it keeps getting better and, and more relevant. So, you know, I don't want to seem like, you know, it's it's not worth doing because it is. Oh, nor do I. I mean, my point in making that statement was that every time I listen to it, there's something else I think about or, or see that I didn't before. So any other comments? All right, then we're adjourned. <laughs>